Coming up next, we invite you to meet filmmaker David Lynch in the exclusive IFC series, Independent Focus, produced in conjunction with the independent feature project, West, next on IFC. Now the words that come to mind when you think of an Eagle Scout, like loyal, trustworthy, or courteous, are probably not the words that come to mind when you think of movies like Wild at Heart, or Lost Highway, or Eraserhead, or Blue Velvet. But the movies made by an Eagle Scout, David Lynch, and on independent focus, we're gonna to get to the heart of the contradictions in this man. <laughs> Kind of different from the, the stuff I normally see at the moment. You're stuck with one interpreter. Oh, loves his guns and it's all like because it's it's from just the the around the screwed. Certain movies kind of unnerved me a little more than others. They just didn't have anything to say at the time. I sold just about everything I owned. Like I read the script, I rehearsed the act. The big difference the more money gives you is just more. You talk is very cheap to shoot. It's like you're pontificate about it. Film him not to have studios telling me what to do. My first job in Los Angeles was here at this museum. And I made $5 an hour selling tickets here, which I may be doing after this is over, but that's another conversation. But I know your, a job you had, we were just talking about backstage, was you were making, we just getting started in filmmaking, you delivered the Wall Street Journal and had worked out this really interesting route where you would deliver the paper. Right. Um, I was uh, in the, uh, working on Eraserhead, and um, I was, uh, well, I had a home, uh, and then I got divorced, and I uh, was then living in the stables uh, of this mansion in Beverly Hills. It doesn't sound like a, a hardship case, but um, uh, uh, my ex-wife phoned and said that there was this little bungalow uh, that I could get for $80 a month, and I said, that's too much money. And uh, she said, no, it's, a, it's an unbelievable deal, and you've got to get this place. And uh, so I figured I had to get a job, and I started delivering uh, the Wall Street Journal. And uh, it, was a, it was a great job, uh, because it was one hour a day, uh, and I made $48.02 a week. So it paid the rent, and uh, everything was great. Now, it must have been a very interesting period for you doing that and then working out a razorhead, which took you how long to finish? Five years, but um, we kept running out of money. We shot for a year straight, and then uh, we ran out of money. Uh, that's about the time I got the paper route, and we would um, uh, we would get geared up uh, with some money, and then shoot a scene, and uh, then you know, kind of break down again for a while. But what was that like for you? It must have given you a chance to really live the film as you were making it in a way. It was a beautiful thing. Uh, now. Uh, uh, people have, uh, I have more money to work with, but uh, there's a speed uh, that you have to uh, take, and uh, so you don't sink down into a, a, a film or into a mood. When you go slow uh, and you're living in the set and in that world, uh, it just becomes part of you. It's a, it's a beautiful experience, and ideas, um, more ideas come out of that. So. The race rate must have taken uh, almost kind of an improvisational quality as you were... No, 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 not improvisational. Um, it was very specific, but it took a long time to, to get it right. It's interesting because it's, your movies almost all are textural first, it seemed like. It's a, sort of a sound tapestry with also this really interesting use of space. And I wonder if you, when something like let's say a racer head, how a movie like that comes to you. I mean, obviously it was sort of cooking around for a while. Well, I, I don't know if <clears throat> anybody knows exactly where ideas come from, but um, it's everyone one probably for sure has had the experience of, of getting an idea. And uh, it's, it's strange because uh, um, one minute it's, it's not there, and, and then, it's, then it's there. And, um, <laughs> And so um, films are built um, 
Some ideas are just little fragments. You might get a fragment that um, is very important to you, and it's, um, it becomes like a magnet uh, that pulls other ideas. And um, so um, it's really a beautiful thing to get uh, one of those ideas. And, uh, but a lot of your ideas seem like that. They seem to be, because you can, you can look at any of these movies as fragments, but there is some sort No, 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 the movies aren't fragments. The idea is the beginning. And then uh, it's like one piece of a puzzle. And then the next one comes, and the next one comes. You can't tell when they're going to come. That's the problem. Uh, you just have to sit quietly and, and hope that they, um, they come along. What does that do for work habits, then, if, as you're waiting for ideas to come along? Well, it's, it's a problem. Uh, there's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of um, sitting in a comfortable chair is what I like to, you know, to do. And, um, and uh, it's, a lot like, it's, it's a lot like fishing. <laughs> and a lot of fishing isn't about catching a fish, but just going there. No, no you want to catch a fish, but um, uh, everybody who's fished knows that um, you can only do so much. Um, you, you bait your hook, and you lower it into the water. And you don't always catch and, a fish, uh, either. And, and then you take what you, you know, get. But, um, uh, but a lot of your movies kind of work like almost classic mystery stories. Uh, something that needs to be solved or pieces that need to be put together. Um, and is that one of the things, too, you don't want to offer too many solutions to the clues that are up there? No, the clues are there. And the, um, I like, you know, I love mysteries uh, like a book, uh, but I don't like it when it ends and everything is sewn up um, 100%. So I think some threads um, have, to be, have to remain open. How do you mean? Well, um, just so it's not um, uh, a, a kind of a spoon-fed solution. It's, it's, it's there, the pieces are there, and they feel correct. And then it's up to um, all of us to, you know, to feel our own uh, way. Actually, we're going to talk about really seeing, um, and get into this a little bit, is the Elephant Man, which I grew up in Detroit, and I saw it uh, downtown Detroit with, with an all-black crowd. And the, just the level of empathy that went to that movie was kind of astonishing to me. I wish you could have seen that movie it's with beautiful. that kind of crowd. Uh -huh. But it must have been a surprise to people that it would play with what are considered to be inner city audiences. Not really. Um, that struck a chord. It's a, it's a human being, and it struck a chord uh, uh, with people, you know, fortunately, everywhere. And uh, I don't know why that film came to me, but I'm, you know, very glad that it did. It came as a result partially of Mel Brooks seeing... No, no, no. It came from uh, a man named Stuart Kornfeld. And I'd been trying to... After Eraserhead, I wrote a script called Ronnie Rocket, and I was trying to get that made. And he was an assistant, uh, Mel Brooks' assistant. So, and he'd seen Eraserhead at the New York. Yeah, he'd saw, seen it at the New York. So I called Stuart, and I said, do you know anything I could, you know, direct? And uh, he said, I know four things. Um, I said, Stuart, what are these four things? And he said, uh, well, the first one is a thing called the Elephant Man. And uh, um, a, an explosion really went off in my head. And I said, that's, that's it. And um, <laughs> so that, that... So you never heard the other three? No, I never, never I may, may have been great. I don't know. What went off in your head, though? What do you think when you hear something like that? It was the only time it ever happened, um, but it was uh, uh, just a, a knowing, uh, a knowingness with a, a, with a sound. <laughs> when, when Mel finally did read this script, um, he said, okay, the writers are in, Jonathan, you're in, Stuart, you can be involved, but who is this uh, David Lynch? And uh, Jonathan said, well, um, you know, you've got to see his film Eraserhead. And Mel said, fine. And so he called me up and says, Mel wants to see Eraserhead. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, um, uh, he said, you know, he wants to see the film. And um, so uh, I said, Jonathan, uh, it's been great, you know, but I'm out. You know, once he sees, the, he sees this picture. And, um, so Jonathan said, no, settle down, you know, and, and uh, so uh, 
Mel had a screening at, uh, over at 20th Century Fox in the screening room there. And for some reason, Jonathan made me come over and um, I was pacing out, out in front of the doors to the theater and uh, suddenly the doors fly open and Mel is racing toward me with open arms and hugs me and says, you're a madman, I love you. <laughs> so. Now, as you were making Alpha Man, was it almost kind of like automatic writing for you in that way, that it was this thing you, you obviously connected with when you heard the title of it, but do you find that was the case in the making of it as well? No. Um, well, it was, it was a baptism of fire because it was the first, um, Eraserhead was uh, very personal and a very small crew and it took five years. And now it was um, going to England and doing a Victorian drama and with, with a lot of big names. And I didn't, I didn't really, I, I felt it, but when I got there, um, all I really knew were pictures um, of Victorian England. And um, it happened one day, I was in a place called the East, uh, East London Hospital, which was a derelict hospital. But it still had beds in the wards, and it had, um, but it was just about a foot of dust uh, in the in the place, and I was walking in that hospital, and uh, like a wind blew into me, and I I I was uh, I knew what it felt like to to be in that time, and I, after that I felt like I owned it, and uh, it was all all right. It sounds almost spiritual, you know, the way this movie. Comes. Well, it's a spiritual picture. Um, John Hurt. Uh, said that uh, he'd sit for eight hours getting made up, and during those eight hours, when he came out, he uh, was uh, John Merrick. It, it came over him uh, during those uh, hours, each time. Now, how'd you find John Hurt? You must have looked around at a lot of people before you got to him. Yeah, John Hurt had a, a hairless left arm. And, um, okay. But, um, <laughs> That was a secondary reason. Um, the primary reason was that uh, John Hurt maybe is one of the finest actors in the world. You know, John Hurt had a kind of a, a such a, a, a chameleon-like ability to change. And uh, uh, he had a kind of a aura of, of uh, greatness to him. Uh, it was, there wasn't a lot of uh, other choices, it seems. Now tell me what it was like for you to move now from Elephant Man. You must have had your choice of things. Are you, were you still trying to get Ronnie Rocket going at that point? I, after every film, I try to get Ronnie Rocket going. <laughs> <laughs> What's it about? I don't, uh, I always say the same thing. It's no. about a um, <laughs> uh, uh, man who's um, three and a half feet tall with red hair and 60 cycle alternating current electricity. And then you couldn't get Ronnie Rocket made, so... Uh, I started actually writing Blue Velvet after The Elephant Man. And I wrote two drafts, and they were really bad. And, um, Why do you say that? Well, uh, the head of the studio uh, called me up and started screaming at me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but he was right, you know, in some ways. Um, and I got, you know... Um, what did he object to? I mean, what was the problem? I forget, uh, he said very bad things to me, but in a, in a, in a, in a short amount of time, so I can't remember. Um, uh, one thing led to another, and I began you know, working on Dune. But what was it you saw in Dune that made you think that you could? Oh, there was many things. Uh, there was a lot of, it was, a, it was a kind of like a poem to me. But there's so much detail, and I'm just wondering what sort of spoke to you in the way that other stuff did in, in Dune. I honestly can't remember. I, I, um, I really blocked out a lot of uh, that. Because, I mean... Oh, it's a pain, very painful experience. But that's when you found Kyle MacLachlan, right? Kyle, uh, that's when I first, you know, met and worked with Kyle. So you get done with that, and that's a year of your life. It wasn't Three pleasant. years. Three years. From start um, to finish? From start to finish, yeah. You've worked on Blue Velvet during uh, 
during the... After I finished Dune, uh, I, we went to see uh, Dino, my agent and I, and... Um, Dino De Laurentiis. Dino De Laurentiis. And he says, David, what, what do you want to do next? Uh, I said, I want to do this picture, Blue Velvet. And um, he says, you, you own? And I said, yes. And, uh, but I didn't realize that I didn't own it. Um, uh, that while I was working on Dune, it went into turnaround, and, and then no one picked it up, so it went back to Warner Brothers, and uh, they owned it. And uh, but anyway, uh, Dino got on the phone, and um, the story is that he was talking to the uh, president, I guess, and uh, a girl was running down the hall to stop him from selling it, and before she got to the office. Um, he'd sold it to Dino. Was it kind of like a world that you felt that you knew in some ways too? I knew it and I didn't know it. Um, it's, it's partly based on impressions from uh, my life, but um, a lot of it is coming from someplace else. Did you know that Kyle would be the guy for that too? Yes, uh, but Kyle didn't want to do this film for, for a while, and I don't know, I can't remember exactly why. I think he was a bit afraid of it. And then um, uh, something happened, and he he you know went for it. It's, it's a, another unsettling movie that seemed kind of an interesting thing to go into the mainstream because there's certainly nothing else like it at the time. Um, and I just wonder, as you were working on it, if you felt that it was such a departure from things that were around. No, no, no. Um, you never do something just to do something uh, different. You can't figure what the world would be like a year or a year and a half after you start. Uh, you can't worry about those things. Uh, sometimes it's surprisingly good, uh, the reception, and sometimes it's surprisingly bad. When you first heard the song Blue Velvet, what did it do to you? It didn't uh, conjure up uh, this film. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, there was something about it uh, this blue and a, a texture, and uh, somewhere along the line, it came to be two other colors. Uh, I mean, it was black, red lips, uh, green lawn, and this, you know, blue velvet. It's also one of these movies where the textures come at you first. That that whole long opening shot that introduces us to this world. It's like worlds and worlds under worlds. Well, and I told you the first things that came. The right. next thing that came was um, someone finding an ear. Uh, in the field, and um, that um, ear to me became a ticket uh, to some other, uh, it started the, the trip to some other world. And as you were making Blue Velvet, did you have any idea what you wanted to do next? I had no idea. And it was four years before I, or well, four years Please? before I finished the film. Why so long a lifetime? Well, you need to get an idea that you fall in love with. And um, these ideas um, are not around every corner, so you don't know when they're going to happen. It was um, one day uh, my friend uh, Monty calls me up and asked me to read a book called Wild at Heart, and I read it, and that was it. Um, that's what I wanted to do then, so um, uh, that's how it happens. It's either a book or an idea. So what did you see in the book that made you want to do it? I saw a love story uh, in, a, in a, a violent and insane world. And it, the feeling in the air was like that to me then. So I, 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 and I saw a love story where the man and the woman were equal. But it's a powerful, I mean, a very violent movie. And it got a lot of um, sort of outrage responses to it. Were you surprised at that? Well, I feel that uh, films, for the most part, don't start violence. They, they mirror violence. They mirror, you know, what's happening. So that's, that was wild at heart. Which seems odd because every movie you've made has been different from one that's come before. Well, yeah, again, it's the ideas, you know. Uh, you don't um, <clears throat> repeat yourself. Um, you're waiting for that next thing. And the next thing for you was television. Well, that, yeah, that was Twin Peaks. <laughs> now, how did that come about? Uh, I had met <clears throat> Mark Frost, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, I'm a smoker. I would really love to have a smoke right now. 
Go ahead. Is, is it okay? Man, that would be beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have some water, too. Okay. I was waiting for you to light up up here. Um, anyway, we got together, and strangely, the idea started flowing. And um, we worked at Mark's house, and um, uh, you sometimes things just unfold in a, in a really beautiful way. And uh, I remember when we finished the pilot script, uh, it was late at night, and I drove back, and I stayed up and read it. And I called up Mark and I said, you know, this thing is, is really good. It really feels gr really good. And uh, he said, it does. And he, we were surprised. And was it pretty much the script that you wrote that you shot? That they, exactly. The network didn't ask for a lot of changes at all? No, the network stayed um, very, you know, much out of it and uh, were very supportive in the, in the, in the beginning. In the beginning? Yeah. <laughs> so did that change? Well, it was our idea that um, um, Laura Palmer's uh, killer would, would not be found and, uh, for a long time. And that, um, that, would, that would move to a more background uh, story. And, uh, but it needed to be there always as the prime you know, mystery. And once you solve that, uh, we felt we'd be you know, finished. And it was true. So you finish your television and you decide to do what did I decide to do? I'm asking you. I, um, I did, uh, oh no, I, I did um, Firewalk With Me. Thank you. There's some sequences in that film that um, uh, deeply thrill me. And, um, uh, but that went over very badly. And um, during the year or year and a half that it took to make that, the world changed in a way that it was um, extremely, you know, poorly received. So um, that was um, when you make something that you really love and you get uh, bad reviews and you know uh, bad box office. It's not as painful as like with Dune, where I knew I'd uh, done things wrong, and then it still turned out poorly. So it's a double, double negative. So then you. Then I waited until 1995 um, when Barry and I started writing Lost Highway. And how did you decide to write with him? He wrote a book called Night People, and in it was a phrase called Lost Highway. And we mentioned the two girls are talking about uh, going down the Lost Highway. And something about those words uh, struck me and started a dream going. And those words. Uh, connected with an idea that I that came also um, one other night, and uh, I told Barry about that idea, and we he said about Lost Highway, let's write something. So uh, that those two things united and started us going. How do you come to find music for the movies? Because that's a very important part of the pictures. Um, a lot of music is found up front, um, and you get kind of gather together music. Um, and then I work with Angelo Badalamenti, um, and um, we we sit and I talk to Angelo, and then he uh, starts you know working, and then I talk to him some more, and he starts working over here, and then little by little something forms that feels right. So I go into shooting with um, a lot of either existing music and Angelo's music, and. Um, play these things while we're shooting uh, through the headphones so I can hear the dialogue and the music at the same time. Sometimes we play it out loud. And um, you know, it's, it helps you verify a mood and a pace. And, um, and then a lot of music comes later, too. But the more you have up front, you know, the better off you are. The many ideas um, come out of music. A picture starts forming in your head and uh, or characters come or both uh, just out of the music and um, it's um, every time I work with Angelo so something like that happens. Well, the thing was time to do now is go to the audience for some questions. Hi, uh, I was wondering, I have a early draft of uh, Blue Velvet 
Yeah. With an alternate ending that has uh, Dorothy jumping off the, uh, the roof of her apartment building. And I was just curious uh, when that, if that was actually filmed and when the, uh, when the idea came about to switch the ending to the, uh, the park scene. Well, something isn't finished until it's finished. And along the way uh, of any project, uh, uh, one lots of times gets bad ideas. And um, hopefully you, you catch them and get rid of them. And so every, every draft, every early draft, they should be destroyed. And, um, <laughs> and a script is, is only a, a, a way to get a kind of a structure and, and certain things right. And uh, then the film is, is what it's aimed toward. And um, so a script is, is not a, a thing really that um, really means anything after, after you, the film is finished. Hi, I was wondering what it is that you see that you want your audience to understand when you show doppelgangers and opposites and the dark side of life versus the light side? You know, these ideas that come along, they, um, they th sort of th thrill you and uh, they inspire you to uh, translate those to film. And uh, the whole process is, is kind of beautiful. And um, they feel a certain way when they arrive, and you try to get that feeling and, and even more in the final thing. And um, if it feels correct to you, you think, well, maybe it will feel uh, that way for others. And you know it won't feel that way for everyone. Oh, one last question, I guess, here. Hi, David. I wanted to ask you, when you get to the filming process, do you have every single frame inside your head, or is it something that's continually developing when you get to editing? Like, for instance, the scene in Lost Highway when you bring the um, cabin that's burning in the very beginning of the film. Is that something that That's a have? good question. There are certain things that you uh, discover along the way. That, that, that burning cabin was never in the, in the script. And um, there's a special effects guy I'd love to work with named Gary D'Amico. And I was out in the desert. We were shooting in the desert. And um, something struck me. And I asked Gary if he had any explosives. <laughs> and, um, so. Uh, he said, yeah, I've got some things. Uh, how big an explosion do you want? And I said, really, really big. <laughs> and um, he couldn't get all the stuff that he wanted to get. And in a strange way, uh, that worked out. You know, the explosion is, um, it's, it's many colors. It's not quite powerful. It, it, it just sort of floats the stuff out. Whereas a larger explosion would just obliterate uh, the cabin. So it, it turned out so beautiful because he didn't have the right things and he wasn't prepared. Um, that's just a happy accident. Once, once um, you have something like that, it, it could feed its way into someplace else. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Let's thank David Lynch for being here. Tonight. Thank you very much. You're watching The Lynch Who Stole Christmas, a full day of David Lynch, only on the Independent Film Channel.